Hi friends and welcome to our midweek edition of our postings where we study the book of James. I, I, I want to just introduce this week by saying that it is always bittersweet to me to come to this point in a study. And what I mean by this point is that we have been journeying through the book of James now since uh, somewhere back in April, I think, and it's taken us through most of the spring. It's taken us through most of the summer. It's taken me and my family from Midland Church in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, traveling across the country now here in Castaic, California, watching the Lord do amazing things. Um, and in this intermittent time, we've been journeying together in the book of James. And so it is bittersweet in that it's sweet to, to think of all we've come through. It's uh, bitter to think that we're done with James. It's been a great adventure, and I hope you've enjoyed it. All of these lessons are available at paulwhiteministries.com. You can watch them. You can listen to them. Some of them will come from a church service setting, the ones back in Missouri, and then others will come from this spot right here in my office. And I don't claim that we have the best, certainly the best setup, but uh, we're just trying to share with you the Word and uh, go through some of these passages that some people have, have considered to be difficult, and I would agree some of them are rather difficult. We come to one in our closing segment here that I don't know has ever been categorized as difficult, but I believe it is one of those texts that perhaps is a bit misunderstood. <clears throat> to show you what I mean, I'd like to read the remainder of the book of James. Don't panic, that's not all that much. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, and we read through the end of the chapter, that's through verse 20. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now there seems to be two different items to deal with. I want to, for sake of our study, deal with both of them as we conclude our study in the book of James with the subtitle, The Prayer of a Righteous Man. Father, I thank you for the journey you've put us on with our audience. I thank you for the text. I thank you that you are the living word. And I thank you that we have seen you in the flesh in the form of Jesus and we know the word is alive. Now I ask your help as we conclude this study and we journey into the beauties of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice in the 16th verse, I dealt with the first half last week on confess your trespasses to another, one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So I want to concentrate on the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The old King James, the effectual fervent prayer, really just means what it says in the new King James, the effective. But the word fervent is closer to the word supplication. Now, what I want you to grab is James's usage of the phrase, the righteous man. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, he hasn't talked a lot about righteousness in this letter. Remember, James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He has not dealt with righteousness in the same way that Paul deals with righteousness. In fact, James is dealing with righteousness would be in conflict in some manners to Paul. And, and you can go back and listen to our study as we dealt with James talking about righteousness and how faith needed works. So I don't want to get into all that again, but I do want you to remember that he's writing to, a, to primarily a Jewish audience. I'm placing my ribbon in the text because I want to go back and show you how important effective prayer was in the history of Israel. 
Numbers chapter 11, and if you're a journeyer in the Word, take journeys with us in the Word, this is a good one to go on. I'll read you a couple of verses. Numbers chapter 11, I want to read these two verses slowly. I just want you to watch the story unfold and then watch how the story shifts. Numbers 11, 1 and 2. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. Did you catch what happened? The people complain, and the Lord gets angry. Why? Because unbelief was the problem in Israel. They did not believe that God was going to fulfill his covenant with Abraham, in which he said he would give them all of the, the land, and that the families of the earth would be blessed through them. And all they ever had to do was believe, and they would have received it. But they start to complain and show forth unbelief, rank unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 really brings out the, the severity of the unbelief of Israel. As they complain, the anger of God's aroused. I don't want to deal too much with that in this segment, but what happens next is the people feel no comfort in going to God. They do not feel like they, are, they have the right to go to God. In fact, way back in Exodus, they surrendered that right. <coughs> Excuse me. When they said to Moses, God's too terrible for us to talk to. You talk to God on our behalf. So by Numbers 11, when they're dying in mass because of the wrath of God, they don't turn to God and say, we're going to talk to you. Instead, they turn to Moses and they say, Moses, would you go talk to God? And the text tells us that when Moses talked to God, the anger of the Lord was quenched because Israel had the idea that if the righteous man talked to God, if God's man talked to God, God would move. And then, corporately, by the time you get to Second Chronicles 7, when Solomon is dedicating the temple, and he says, "If my people, God says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and you know the scripture. And so by Second Chronicles, God is saying, now the people have a temple, so the people ought to be able to cry out to me. And then when Jesus comes along, Jesus takes it, not just, it's not just Moses, it's not just the people, Jesus then says, you are going to be able to ask the Father anything in my name and he's going to do it. And he makes it personal, you're going to be able to do this. Now, why are you going to be able to do this? Because I'm going to die on your behalf and I'm going to give you my name and then you're going to be able to ask anything of the Father in my name and he's going to move. It's not going to be a Moses thing. It's not going to be a temple thing. It's going to be an inward temple thing. And then you'll be able to, to talk to the Lord. This is why I, know, I, I, don't, I believe no more. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it right. I no more believe in our need to pray 2 Chronicles 7.14 in order for God to move than I do my need to go find me a Moses and have him pray on my behalf. Because Christ has made me righteous. Now, I don't want to get the cart ahead of the horse here, but what we're talking about in James 5 is the prayer of a righteous man. So for Israel, their mentality has been, whatever goes wrong, we'll find a righteous man and he'll pray. And I used, as our example from Numbers 11, I used the idea of Moses. But James doesn't use Moses. Instead, now let's go back to James 5. Instead, in James chapter 5, verse 17, the very next verse, James uses a different character by using, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now what James has done is taken the other heroic character of the Old Testament. In fact, the two pillars of the Old Testament are Moses and Elijah. Who are the two men that show up on the Mount Transfiguration with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. What do they represent? The law and the prophets. 
So James could just as well have used Moses, but instead he uses Elijah because Elijah has a, a very important part of his prayer life that we'll bring out as we go. Before I do that, I want to I show you not only, number one, Elijah is Israel's greatest example of a prayer warrior, but number two is James is using an argument that's very typical for the early church, facing what they were facing, seeing the signs, wonders, and miracles that they're seeing. They use this, ar this argument of, I want you to catch this phrase, Elijah's a man with a nature like ours. I want you to see if you can catch that again. Go with me to Acts chapter 14. The Apostle Paul is at Lystra, and in, he's with Barnabas. I want to read the story. Verse 8, And in Lystra a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Now then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitudes, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. And we preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. I'm going to get back to that in a moment, but I know you caught it because remember James 5, Elijah, a man with a nature like ours. The old King James says, uh, Elijah, a man with like passions. Paul uses the same phrase at Lystra when he, they think he's, he's Hermes and they think Barnabas is Zeus because they've just raised a lame man and made him walk. And so Paul and Barnabas are fighting against the press, the press of people who are trying to idolize them. And Paul says, I'm, we're just a men just like you have the same nature. So Paul is saying, there's nothing special about us there's nothing unique about us. And I think the early church would have said the same thing regardless. There's nothing that makes us who we are. It's all that we are just a new creation. Paul would say in Galatians, I, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which I'm crucified unto the world and the world has been crucified unto me. Now, I, I do think it's worth pointing out and I find this pretty interesting that when Paul and Barnabas start to preach to these idol-worshiping crowds, here's how they preach. They say, we're men with the same nature as you, and we're just preaching you to turn from the useless stuff to the living God, the same God that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that's in them, who in past generations has allowed all nations to just walk whatever way they wanted to. Now 17, nevertheless, he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good, and he gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, and he filled our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Do you just see how Paul preached to a people who never heard of God and never heard of Jesus, but they knew about Zeus, and they knew about Hermes. And when Paul raises the lame man and he can walk, Paul says, look, don't, I'm, no, I'm no God. I have the same nature inside of me that you do, but I want to introduce you to the God who has always been good to you. And how do you know he's been good? Paul even says he has witnessed to us by giving us rain. He made the rain fall. What did Jesus say about the rain? Jesus said the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Why? Because it's God's way of providing for man by giving him rain to grow his crops, water to survive on. <clears throat> it's God's way 
of providing so that man knows somebody loves him. Way before God had sent Jesus to die on the cross, he's blessing the earth with his goodness, and he still does it. I'm living in California, and they're in the middle of a five-year drought. I I just believe, my wife and I were talking about this the other day, and, and she spoke a word into my spirit, and she said, just remember that we do not have favor. We are favored. And so i kind of been taking that and running with it this week. I'm believing that I don't just have favor, but I am favored. So I'm believing that if I've moved to California, I'm believing that God's favor is on me. If the state needs rain, I'm believing they're going to get rain. I turned on the news the other day, and they're predicting, meteorologists are predicting, a uh, Godzilla El Nino for California that they say we may have more rain this fall and this winter than we've had in years. And I I just said, of course we will. (laughs) Because I'm just believing God that we have, don't just have favor, but we are favored. Now, I was just a little side note. I really believe that with all of my heart, by the way, Uh, even about the El Nino. But God is always blessed with rain just to show how, how much that he cares. Now, when you go back to James 5, and you see that, he, that James describes Elijah as a man with a nature like ours. What does he use as a way to show you Elijah's power to pray? Rain. Verse 17, he prays earnestly that it, doesn't, that it won't rain, and it does not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prays again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. It was Elijah's way of saying he was able to hold back the rain, he was able to provide the rain. Now here's, here's what I find interesting. The rain is a witness that God was for them. It was a witness that God was a blessing. And according to James, Elijah, their hero, was the kind of prayer life that a man ought to have. But James has tipped his hand. Because in the 16th verse, he says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he tries to introduce Israel back to a hero, Elijah. But what you and I know is this. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul said, God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So that means that Jesus became sin on my behalf so that I could become the righteousness of God by what I love to call the great exchange, that he, just, he exchanged his life for mine. Now, if that be the case, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That was a really hard thing for me to say when I first started coming into the knowledge of God's grace. It was very hard for me to say, I am the righteousness of God. But I am the righteousness of God in Christ, and knowing that I am the righteousness of God in Christ then I can apply that to James 5. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If Elijah had a nature like me, and now Christ has taken my nature into him and has been crucified on my behalf and raised from the dead so that I can have life, then by faith I am the righteous man. Therefore, I pray and I can see Elijah-like results. Is that not what James is saying? Otherwise, why bother to tell his audience, hey, Elijah's just like you. Elijah has the same nature you have. James is saying, these guys don't have any more than you. I I love it in Hebrews 11 when you get to the hall of faith. And we dealt with this when we studied Hebrews. And the author of Hebrews opens every verse with, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Why does he do this? Because in their mentality, these men were not great men by faith. These were great men by morality. They were just great men. In fact, they might not have been men. They were Superman. They weren't real. They were from another planet. And James says, man, Elijah was like you. And he was like me. I wish James had went a little farther. I think Paul would have. You are the righteous man. 
When you pray, it avails much. Much can happen when you pray. I, 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 I don't know what your prayer life is like. And I don't think you have to write it down and you have to meet God in a corner and get on your knees and talk for an hour. Let it be natural. Let it be beautiful. Let it be spontaneous. Let it come from a, a place of beautiful passion in the inside where you just talk to Him. Everything else is, it starts getting religious. And prayer should be relational. I mean, I don't, I, and I don't want my kids to feel like they can only talk to me at certain times of the day. I want them to feel like they can talk to me at any time of the day. And I want them to feel like when they talk to me, they have my attention. Now, I'm just a, a man like anyone else, and so I really mess that up sometimes. And I'm afraid I don't give them the attention that they need. But I want them to, to know that they have Dad's heart and they have Dad's ear. And a lot of us men feel like, well, our kids ought to know they have our heart because we buy their school shoes and we, and we pay the bills and we sign them up for ball, ball and and I think they know that they have our heart, but they don't know that they have our ear. And it's, it's just as vital, if not more vital, to let your kids know they have your ear, that they can come to you and you'll listen. I'm doing all of this to show you what we have in Jesus, what we have in our Father. You are the righteous man. Therefore, your prayer is always effectual. Don't give me the... Well, you're a righteous man, but you better pray hard. I want to ask you, how do you pray hard? What does pray hard look like versus pray soft? I mean, would pray hard be scream and yell? I remember when we would lay hands on people in the church right around the time we were pouring oil on their head. And you lay hands on them and then everybody just scream as loud as they could and you push and pull and yell and... And we had the idea, in fact, it would get quoted. You go, well, you know, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Let's get effectual. Let's get effective in our prayer. Here's what I believe about that, just based on this scripture. You're the righteous man. Any prayer you pray is effective. How can it not be? Elijah prayed it. He didn't have Jesus living on the inside. He had a nature just like you. He prayed, God moved. You have Christ living on the inside. You pray, God moves. All right. 19 and 20. Let's close it out. This is a cool passage. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I want to show you, first of all, the word brethren at the top of 19. And remember, if you go all the way back to James 1.1, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, James has been writing to his Jewish brothers. So he's speaking the word brethren. I don't think in the same Christian sense necessarily that the book of Acts does as much as he is a Jewish sense of brethren. So if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let that man know that he who turns a sinner. And I say sinner. Um, we see the word sinner and we think... Um, Somebody who's an adulterer or a drunk or whatever. But in the context of James writing to Jews, a sinner could have been anyone who had fallen away from their heritage, fallen away from who they are. And so James is speaking to the Jewish brethren. However you interpret that or wherever you land on that, I don't think is quite as vital as what happens when we turn someone back to the truth and how we turn someone back to the truth. Because watch, here's the important thing, verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. He doesn't mention saving a soul from hell, but he does mention saving a soul from death because when you turn away from the truth, which is Jesus... You turn back towards the system of this world, and the system of this world reeks of death. So you go, you had you towards a system that cannot produce life. To me, the message of Christianity is not 
come meet Jesus so you can go to heaven. It's come to Jesus so he can put his, his heaven inside of your hell. So that, or come to Jesus so he can live his life through you. Those, are, those have far more basis of New Testament scripture than come to Jesus so you can miss hell. So he, the, James doesn't mention the soul going to hell, but the soul facing death. And he says, if you want to avoid that death, they can't mean physical death because nobody avoids that death. So he's talking in spiritual terms. If you want to avoid the death of the soul, turn a brother back and cover a multitude of sins. So the question becomes this. How do you turn someone back and cover a multitude of sins at the same time? Oh, I'm glad you asked. If you're in James, then the very and you're in chapter 5, the very next book is 1 Peter. And that's the book I want you to go to. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Actually, go to verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Time out. The end of all things is at hand. If you don't know what Peter's talking about, or if you think that Peter means we're living in a prolonged 2,000 year last days, then I highly encourage you to go watch our video blog series, which is available on our app and on our website, and it's free, and you can watch it on our Facebook page, Paul White Ministries, where we are working our way up to and then through the 24th chapter of Matthew. So if you want to know why Peter says you're the end, we're in the end of all things, but look at 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for a love for love will cover a multitude of sins what will cover a multitude of sins love we must be talking about we know we're talking about loving people but we must be within the context of above all of this end stuff this this whole jewish system's coming to an end above all of that if you want to see people's lives changed, love them, and present to them that message of love. So if you go back now to the end of James 5, and you turn someone from the error of their way, you save their soul from death, and you cover a multitude of sin. How do you cover a multitude of sin? Love covers a multitude of sin. So how do you bring a brother back from his erring ways? You smack him, and you threaten him with hell. And you beat him up. No, you love him. And some would say, well, I love him so much, I'm going to go ahead and punch him because I want him to know the truth. I don't, I, don't think you, I don't think you really believe that because everything you say has to be really held up under the light of family. And if that's how you treat your kid, I want my kid to know that I love him, so I'm going to slap him in the face then that probably has skewed your mentality about how, it's how we bring people into the love of God. I, I just want to say, I've had a lot of fun. I've had so much fun dealing with the book of James, and we've had such great response from people who have been blessed by this book and have seen it now through a lens that they had never seen it before, who encountered it in a way they had never encountered it before. So I'm very, very excited about that. I also want to remind you of the vlog the video blogs that we're posting online and at Facebook, we usually debut them on Facebook, either on my page or on the Paul White Ministries page, and then we move them to the app and YouTube and the website. They're all up there usually by the end of the week. I've been posting the vlog somewhere around Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, they're 20 minutes apiece, and we're dealing with the subject of the, end, the, the finished work eschatology. So we're leading up to Matthew 24 and then working our way through Matthew 24. I'd also like to announce that we'll be posting another message from a California home meeting. We're getting a lot of response of people loving seeing us in living rooms. And living rooms are some of my favorite venues. We're, we're posting some of those at our website on the weekend edition at paulwhiteministries.com. I also want to say this, and I'll leave it alone. But if you have never given into the ministry and we've been a blessing and been feeding you, I, I'm just believing that God's going to begin to speak to your heart about giving. And I believe there are some people out there who've never given, who've been blessed day after day after day after day by this ministry. And it really helps us to go forward. There's a lot of things I dream about doing. Many of them we can't afford to do. 
I don't have the backing of a local church anymore, so we can use your help. I don't ask for money or beg for money. I'm not asking for your money now. I'm asking you to listen to the Spirit. Whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do, do that. But some have been listening for a long time have never supported. I just believe you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. I believe there's some that could give very, very generously to the cause of the gospel of grace. I want to pray for you as we do every week. We'll close the book of James. I do not know what we're going to do for next Wednesday. But if the Lord willing, and we're here for it, um, it'll be uh, it'd probably be a book verse by verse, but it'll be fun. All right? Father, thank you for our audience. Thank you for our brothers and sisters and our friends around the world. Thank you for this word. Thank you that we are the righteous and that our prayers avail much. Thank you that we can love a brother with truth and we can see their soul saved from a death on this place, in this place. They can have life and they can have heaven. Father, bless our audience with favor. Show them your love. Witness to them of your love. And for those, Lord, who you place on their hearts to support, we believe they're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.